We're going to go. We have to be, and it's going to be great. I'll tell you two stories. Okay, I like that. Okay, so. That's good. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be back. So, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you you, this third and last day of International Symposium on Gustav Metzger entitled The Need for Art to Change the World, organized by the Department of Art and Media, DKM. I would like to express my renewed thank, thank yous to Svetlana Heger, the head of the Department of Art and Media, for this outstanding and all-encompassing all event, and to Laura von Niedenshauser. I'm getting there. If only there was a fourth day, I would be, I'd be there with your name the research associate and symposium manager for keeping this ship afloat and selling to Bonport. I am also extremely grateful to the technical team for making it run so smoothly. Following to your first day on Thursday with Christian Stein's powerful, deeply moving opening conference, a thorough an analysis within Gustave, a deep investigation that continues to resonate ever so strongly two days later, and I'm sure for many, many days to come, which was followed by the conversation with outstanding hero, the artist Iva Davis, and yesterday, began with the intense foray into Gustav's complex and too little explored relationship with computer art as expertly expressed by Catherine Mason. Then Jonathan Benthol, who delivered a most generous lecture revisiting their shared words and works with Gustav from 1968 through to 1973, offering a prospective outlook with the resources needed to prevent mass extinction. It was a delight to conclude this second day in discussion with Andrew Wilson, who offered a much needed reappraisal of Gustav's early development as an artist and the need to reconcile art and social engagement, as Andrew expressed in their shared experience with Gustav since 1983 onwards, through to the renewed radical proposition, the historic photographs. As time ran out and we could only begin to mention Extinction Rebellion, I shall look forward to the roundtable at 5 p.m. that will offer us the possibility to pursue our conversation then and dwell deeper into the single burning issue, if you mind me, the heel choice of word, of our time as we will reunite either Catherine, Christine, Andrew, along with our final day guest, Norman Rosenthal. And thus, please do, please do allow me to introduce you to Norman. Sir Norman Rosenthal is an extraordinary British independent curator and art historian, born in Cambridge in November 1944. From 1970 through to 1974, he was exhibition officer at Brighton Museum and Arts and Galleries. He was director of exhibitions at the ICA in London between 1974 and 1976, where Norman organized with writer and curator Christos M. Joachimides the influential exhibition of new radical German art entitled Art into Society, Society into Art, Seven German Artists. Art into Society took place between the 30th and the 24th of November 1974, as part of the German month in a renewed celebration of Britain's entry into the common market. Now we're leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to do another show. This is, this is the manifestation of out. I will tell you more about out because <laughs> I'm organizing an exhibition in Venice, which is, I can't even remember the title now, but it, I was going to call it out, but it was somehow vetoed by my co-curator, a rather stupid lady, not even by the museum, which loved it. <laughs> An exhibition about young British artists, which opens next Friday in Venice. Okay, and it's an absolutely fantastic exhibition. 
but I wanted to call it out because out is a very good word now. It replies, it replies Britain leaving, but also we live in a generation of being out. Do you know what I mean? Out is very much a factor of <clears throat> young people of our time, and I think Gustav would have approved of it as well. I we agree. Hmm? So, anyway, on with your little introduction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a great interrupter, actually. I'm sorry. I can't help No, it. I love that. I mean, that gives you a flair what we are up for. <laughs> uh, the show it's is... Breathless. London Art Now. I keep forgetting, now. you know. Um, um, breathless. London breathless. It's Art called Breathless. Now. But it was going to be called Out. We um, will call it, it then Out from now. somehow vetoed by my co-curator, which causes me great distress, which is why I still think of the exhibition as out. And when I do my press conference next week, I'm going to say it was going to be called out so that everybody realizes what it's all about. <laughs> because the show is about being out in every way, you know, pants down and all that. <laughs> but who was in though? Back in 1974, the artists included into art into society included Joseph Beuys, Hans Hacker, Klaus Stark, Albert D. K.P. Bremer, Dieter Hacker, and Gustav Metzger. The following year, in 1975, Norman Ogden worked with Joachim Edis on the exhibition Eight Artists, Eight Attitudes, Eight Greeks between the 5th of November and the 4th of December. That's where I wanted to tell you my first of my little stories. Well, the other hold one on. Is the, actually, it's the second of my little stories Good. about that manifestation. Okay? okay. This is the first time that Kunelis ever showed, for example, Yanis Kunelis ever showed in London. There was a big installation by Takis, who's now being rather strangely celebrated. He's just died. The great artist, Greek artist Takis, who's being celebrated at the very Tate Gallery at this moment. Isn't that right, Andrew? Hmm? <laughs> Takis. But anyway, at that manifestation, you know, the Greeks, for obvious reasons, are very keen on poetry, okay? And so, obviously, it's, you know, it was a thing. We're thinking about people like, obviously, Kafafis, but also poets like Sepphoris and Embirikos and so on and so forth. And so quite a lot of these poets, like another poet called Taxis, you know, wonderful gay poet from, from Athens who was a friend of uh, Yolas and so on and so forth. And they all came to London. And we had this poetry reading in the cinema of the ICA, uh -huh. okay? And there wasn't a single person in the audience. I mean, you know, this audience is far too small, but there were, in that ed, this particular event, there wasn't one person. So the, the issue was, should we go ahead? So I became the only audience, okay? And then I said, we have to go ahead because in the end, the ether will remember the event. We mustn't stop. And I feel that about this event too. They're not too, there are a handful of people and I gather perhaps out there in the, or in the ether, uh, people are watching online, hopefully, 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 or maybe not, okay, in the, in, you know, in the alienated uh, confines of their own homes. And that's another subject that Gustav had a lot to say about. But the fact was that the poetry reading with these great Greek poets, you know what I mean? went ahead and there was not, apart from my little self, there was no, not one single person in the audience. And I'm rather proud of that little memory. <laughs> well, okay. I can't think of a better audience than you though. Mm -hmm. Norman was exhibition secretary of the Royal Academy between 1977 and 2008. And 31 years. Mm, you and you curated and co-curated an impressive number of fundamental exhibitions, including the seminal A New Spirit in Painting in 1981, or with Joachimides again. And later you went on to curate and co-curate Sensation in 1997, Apocalypse Beauty and Horror in Contemporary Art in 2000, Frank Hauerbach in 2001, or again Basilitz in 2007. Since and Sensation, don't forget. Yeah. Uh. And since your resignation from the Royal Academy, you continued to curate exhibitions and write an established and emerging contemporary artist, including the forthcoming Venice exhibition that opens next Friday. So please do welcome me in, in welcoming Sir Norman Rosenthal. Thank you, Macho. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank Very you. Very nice to you remind me of Frank Auerbach. And Frank Auerbach and Gustav Metzger, of course, came to England roughly at the same time, mm -hmm. both on, presumably on separate kinder transports. Yeah. You know? You know, Gustav was about 13. I'm not quite sure how old Frank was, but he would have been about that same age. 
Mm. And, you know, that basically meant being on a kinder transport was almost a guarantee that your parents were going to be exterminated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was born in 44 because my mother just got out of Germany just in time mm. in 19, uh, August 1939. Oh, wow. Now I've become a German citizen to my, I'm not sure whether to my, I am very proud of it. And at the same time, there's a t slight, slight kind of echo of shame in the I, fact. Yeah, can you as imagine? As you can imagine. Uh, very much. Uh, but on the other hand, I have amazing German friends. And also my aunt, my, my mother's mother was saved by her Protestant mm -hmm. uh, military husband who was then told to leave either the army or his wife and he left the army they hid underground for mm -hmm. about four years without or five years without going to a concentration camp and my aunt my mother's sister survived and he died at the end of the war because of course there was no medicine to be had and he died of mm -hmm. terrible pneumonia in those dying horrible months of 1940 end of 1944 to 1945 mm -hmm. which you know must make made the, 19, the 30 years war look like a, must have made the 30 years war look like a kind of paradise on earth mm. compared what was, to what was going on in Germany at that time. Mm. Right. Both for Germans and, of course, for Jews, but also for German people themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you're becoming European. So I want, you know, I'm becoming a German in, in order to keep my, I hate the, you know, having my Europeanness taken away from me. Unfortunately, I'm in a position to mm -hmm. be able to do that. Not everybody is, of course. Mm -hmm. No, but let's celebrate that, though. Anyway, I don't know whether, whether Gustav would have approved, because, of course, Gustav was very proud of being stateless. He was. He was, you know, he was, you know, he didn't want to take on any citizenship, which I totally understand, because, of course, in a perfect world, there would be no passport. Mm -hmm. I think if we abolished passports, that would be one way of, I think it would be, if you like, then mankind would live where it was possible to live. And that would perhaps, maybe speaking very idealistically, idealistically mm -hmm. eliminate the idea of war. Right. And the possibility of war, which now threatens us once again in many different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Anyway, I had another second story to tell you, which I'm going to tell you. It has nothing to do with Gustav directly. But I thought about it coming here. Because I think what I want to talk about today is, you know, the great topical question of extinction. Mm -hmm. Think about Greta Thunberg and all of that. Greta Thunberg, when I look at her on the television, because she does appear as a kind of, icon figure mm -hmm. when i look at her she looks surprisingly like gustav you know she has that kind of height she has that kind of wonderful naivety mm. she looks like a contemporary or not a contemporary looks like as though the spirit of gustav rests in her but the story i wanted to tell you not really a story it's more like a phenomenon mm -hmm. you know when i was growing up in london london was full of pigeons of course but it was also full of sparrows. Well, there were zillions of sparrows everywhere, all over London. And about 20 years ago, for some weird reason that I couldn't quite understand, <laughs> sparrows not only were less, lesser, but all of a sudden they totally vanished. There are no sparrows in London anymore. And that seems to me like an incredible metaphor for what Gustav, I never discussed this with him, mm. but now that I think about it, I think the disappearance of sparrows in London, you can still find them in certain cities in Europe, you can find them in Madrid, you can find them in Rome, you can even find, you can find them in Berlin. I don't know whether you can find them in Zurich, in you know, sort of, you know, trying to, you know, sit, if you go to a cafe, a sparrow would come, cheeky sparrow would come up and, you know, steal, try to steal a little crumb and so on. But in London, there are no sparrows. And nobody's explained to me why, on the reason why there are no sparrows. But it must have something to do with what I call the world of mass extinction. 
It mm. just has to. It's a kind of kind of phenomenon. It seems trite, it sounds trivial, but I think the disappearance of sparrows in London, Gustav's adopted city, mm -hmm. is a kind of wonderful and very particular, or rather, not wonderful, a kind of tragic metaphor yep. for what he was, what he stood for. Yeah. And Gustav is, in a way, you know, we're not many people in this room here in Zurich at the moment, and I wish there were more, and of course, art is about one thing and one thing only. It's about this manifest, this manifestation that we're in at the moment. Alas, I wasn't able to be here for the last two days when you were doing it. I wish I had been. But, you know, art is about one thing. It's about memory. Mm -hmm. It's the most important thing about art is memory and the things that need to be memorized, you know. After all, there are zillions of artists, most of whom, you know, being an artist, I think, you know, I am an artist. I don't quite know, I don't quite know what they mean. You know, you think, you know, the guy who shows on the Hyde Park railings in London is a kind of artist, perhaps, you know. But what will survive? And I think what we're trying to do and what you've done so beautifully with this book of writings, which I've just glanced at, which seems to be a magnificent book, is about memory. memory. And Gustav is, in fact, in every sense of the word, both in his character, mm -hmm. but also in what he did, because, you know, one thing is the persona that those of us who are in this room who knew him remember, and I did, of course, know him, and I met him, I'll tell you a little bit later, but I mean, it's what he did, and actually his, even his work, his, you know, his concrete work, because obviously he was in many respects, a, you know, a conceptual artist, whatever that, that word yeah. expression means, you know, it's about thinking, Boyce would say later on that art is a form of visual thinking, yeah. You know, that was his definition about art, but he also made a lot of concrete things. But actually, when you begin to add it up, Gustav made a, an ex a surprising number of, would you not agree, of uh, not quite a number of environmental oh, yeah. and things, you know what I mean? Drawing, he made drawings, of course, there was all the work that he did in his earlier mm -hmm. times, which he had always told me about, yeah. and that right at the end of his life, we were able to unpack all the the, the paintings mm -hmm. that now I'm not quite sure where they are. Are they in the Tate Gallery or not? Some of them are, yeah. What? Yeah. Sorry? And the other ones are in storage. They're in the storage. But the, then there's but a they, you know, they're, you know, they're boxes and boxes mm. of amazingly beautiful paintings, some of a handful of which were shown in a rather kind of, again, that was not publicized properly, unfortunately. I don't know how this event has been publicized because in the end, you know, one thing is to do an event. Another thing is to get people to come. The most important thing when you do a manifestation about this thing is to organize your audience. You know, I organize concerts. <laughs> Organizing the concert is the easiest thing. Choosing the music, finding the musicians. You know, I'm very keen on classical music, as you probably know. So I organize concerts of London of young, incredibly talented music. The difficult thing is organizing the audience. Audiences need to be organized. So I'm not criticizing, of course. No. But it's all about organizing an audience. We have and the organ best. Audiences need to be organized. Mm. This is this idea that the disappearance of sparrows, one of the answers is not so much to the disappearing audience, yeah. but uh, with a much more sinister thing. That is, slug killers were laid in gardens and parks, slugs would eat them. And not only sparrows, but thrushes would eat the slugs and were poisoned. And this is one explanation given, which is very relevant to what you're mm -hmm. about to talk about. True. But let's keep on the dissemination of knowledge, though. And even though there's relatively few of us, but only the best, it will be there forever. So like that memory that we're going to share now will be the important part and will be what are we looking forward to us discussing. And I could not agree more that Gustav was indeed an artist of concepts. Yeah, but he was more than that. He was a kind of... He looked like a prophet. Yeah. An Old Testament prophet. A kind of... Jerem what you, if you close your eyes and think, what did Jeremiah look like? 
or indeed what did Isaiah look like, mm -hmm. I would come up with, you know, an image of Gustav. Mm. He was kind of, he had this kind of incredible intensity in his persona, in his way of living. I'm now talking about his person, not about what he did. You know, the way he lived, the way he, for many, many years, seemed to live on the streets. You know, I mean, he, he almost felt he slept on park benches. I'm not quite sure where his homes were, but he certainly lived a kind of very, for m much of his life, mm. he led a very hand-to-mouth existence. You would find him, he would sort of pop up in my life, almost when I never expected him, you know, carrying these large plastic bags yeah. full of newspaper cuttings. Mm. Every morning he would go to the library, the local library, a local library, to read all the newspapers. And, you know, he would collect information. And it was about collecting information that enabled him to make his work and become the prophet of doom we were discussing last night at dinner last night. He was a prophet. But the question is, do prophets, one thing is to be a prophet of doom, and the other thing is to have answers. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, I'm, for example, the other day I picked up an airport. I was at an airport coming here, and I picked up this book by somebody called, I don't know who he is, called David, David Wallace Wells, called The Uninhabitable Earth, A Story of the Future. An epoch-defining book, says The Guardian, and there's all, huh? And I'm going to read you the first paragraph. And this first paragraph is almost like Gustav speaking. It is worse. This is the book, not by Gustav. Yeah. This is a book, a recent book. What I'm trying to say is that Gustav, like Greater Tun, like, you know, is a kind of prophet of, yeah. of today, like he is a prophet of Greater Thunberg, you know. It is worse, much worse than you think. The slowness of climate change is a fairy tale perhaps as pernicious as the one that says it isn't happening at all, and comes to us bundled with several others in an anthology of comforting delusions. The global warming is an Arctic saga, saga, a saga of the Arctic, unfolding remotely. That it is strictly a matter of sea level and coastlines, not an enveloping crisis, sparing no place and leaving no life undeformed, that it is a crisis of the natural world, i.e. animals, sparrows, if you like, and not the human one, and that these two are, are distinct, and that we live today somehow outside or beyond, or at the very least defended against nature, not inescapably within, and literally overwhelmed by it, that wealth can be a shield against the ravages of warming. Wealth can be achieved, can be a shield against the ravages of warming. And that the burning of fossil fuels is a price of continued economic growth, which indeed it is. And that growth and the technology it produces will in inevitably engineer a way out of environmental disaster. And that, there is in, and, and that there is any analog to the scale or scope of this threat in the long span, actually short span, of human history that might give us confident, confidence in staring it, us down. None of this is true. Let's begin with the speed of change. The Earth has experienced five mass extinctions before the one we are living through now each so completely wiping uh, each so completely a wiping of the fossil record that it functioned as a evolutionary reset the the planet's phylogenetic tree first expanding then collapsing at intervals like a lung 80% of all species dead the sparrow 40 million 450 million years ago 70 million years later, 75%. 125 million years later, 96%. 50 million years later, 80%. And 135 million years after that, 
75% again. So, I mean, this tells you something. And I think Gustav was very prescient. He was. Unbelievably prescient. Mm -hmm. Very much thanks to his work in going to, every morning going to the libraries and going to reading newspapers and picking up little nuggets of information, yeah. which he kind of collected in his head because he was an amazing intellectual figure. You know, he had a mind, I'm sure, a mind that could, you know, that both remembered. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he, was had an, he had an incredible memory. He was incredibly kind of particular about facts, mm -hmm. okay? He was also incredibly particular about language. Yeah. Huh? I remember him being incredibly, you know, if you left, if you printed a text and were to leave out a comma, I mean, you could be, you, you felt you were, would you not agree? You know, he was, you felt almost banned. You know, he was like that. He was yeah. incredibly particular about everything. He looked so, he looked, you know, kind of chaotic, mm -hmm. you know, in the way he dressed and the way he wandered around and so on and so forth, the way he walked the streets, but actually deep down, he was incredibly particular. For a long time, he made, made money, a little bit of money so he could eat, basically going to second-hand bookshops and, mm -hmm. you know, combing London for, for old books, which he then passed on to the trade. He was a kind of book trader and for you a very long time. Him, right? I bought books from him too, yeah. you know, because, you know, sometimes he had very wonderful <laughs> second-hand bookshop books, you know. And I remember him having a kind of depot yeah. of them somewhere near Lincoln's Inn Fields, mm -hmm. which I went to once. I was allowed into this. And there was right. this room that he had, you know, piled to the sky, you know, basically there was no room to move, you know, full of newspapers and full of mm -hmm. kind of books. And I, you know, in a way, I'd wanted to stay there for a long time, but I never did. And then he would tell me about this attic somewhere in Hampstead yeah. where he stored all those paintings. But I never got really to see it until... At the very we, end, yeah. until we all managed to see it, mm. when he decided to bring it out and well, rescue them as well. Rescue them. Rescue them. Yeah. But you know, they were so he, you know, he was a kind of archivist. He was a sort of natural archivist of disaster mm -hmm. and a natural archivist of souvenirs. And you know, that's what museums do. You know, we what are museums about? They're, what is a museum? But a kind of place of memory. Yeah. Sometimes the memory is worthless, you know, the Tate Gallery is full of, you know, got incredible things, but got loads of stupid things that could easily, in my opinion, get trashed. But may, do you agree, Andrew? <laughs> what? Uh -huh. <laughs> Anyway, I met Gustav for the very first time doing this exhibition right. uh, in 1974. I was quite, you know, slow. You know, I, I never studied art. I never studied the history of art. So my whole career has been a kind of adventure. And the, the beginning of my adventure was actually when I was at university organizing my first exhibition yeah. in an English provincial university where I uh, organized an exhibition in Leicester, in mm -hmm. Leicester Museum and Art Galleries called Artists in Cornwall. And, you know, I was always interested in museums. Right. You know, I would go to museums all the time as, as a child by myself. Mm -hmm. huh? And, but mostly I was interested in, in old works, you know, because I was interested in the Italian Renaissance, in Baroque art, in 18th century art, Impressionism, and so on and so forth. And, you know, the contemporary art was a more difficult thing. And that I got to later. And so I got this job accidentally uh, at a very important art gallery in London Agnes. called Agnews, you know, which at that time was like the Wildensteins of London, mm -hmm. you know, the leading, you know, the, as it were, a purveyor of old masters through right. the museums of the world particularly American museums with a mm -hmm. huge, huge history. And then later on I left and I became more interested as I was getting, you know, I had a late teenage, yeah. you know, I, became, I was too serious as a child. And my teenage years were really in my late twenties, you know, <laughs> when I began to kind of explore the world. And Is that explore. when you went to Berlin? Yeah, and then, no, that was later, later, yeah. later. And, uh, uh, and I began to kind of 
understand there was a world of English pop art and the King's Road and so on and so forth. I was, you know, I was already in my mid twenties by the time I kind of began to embrace that world mm. as a teenager. And then somehow by chance, I got this job and I discovered the world of English pop art mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And at that time in England, there was a real sense that art only existed in New York. Actually, art was an axis. There was only one axis of art that made any sense at all. That was the London, New York axis. Right. There was no art in Europe. I mean, not now, you know, we're talking about globe art. There's a big globality of art. Yeah. And people think about art in Africa and in Saudi Arabia, I mean, in, in Egypt, in Iran, I mean, everywhere there's art, you know, there's mm -hmm. not a corner of the world. And now museums try to document this. I mean, that's another whole subject, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But at that time, the art world, certainly from an English perspective, was unbelievably narrow. Mm -hmm. And so then England, for some weird reason, reluctantly, in 1973 or 1972, entered the European community as a kind of political, sort of reluctant political choice. And there was the, this thing called the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London on the Mall, you know, just more or less in front of Buckingham Palace. If you can imagine that, you know, very prominently situated by then. It had a, another history, but it, by then it had been moved, you mm -hmm. know, to the Mall. And somebody who was here yesterday, I, your, uh, my dear friend Jonathan Benthel, who had actually been aware, had worked with Gustav much earlier than I had. Yes, indeed, yeah. Um, and therefore knew him. But he was very frank. He was a kind of Francophile yeah. uh, person. Mm. I was a Germanophile, if you like. You know, it's like, it's like Switzerdich, you know what I mean? And then there's the French part of Switzerland. So, you know, I mean, England, I was the kind of German person. I spoke right. German because of my parents. Both my parents spoke German. So I had a certain amount of German in me and I, you know, for various reasons. So I spoke German quite well. I knew quite a lot about its history, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, our dear Jonathan. friend Jonathan did this big manifestation that tried in a way to mediate what you might call French structuralism Indeed, yeah, with that. In to, to, uh, and its cultural implications mm -hmm. at the, the ICA in yeah. 1973 and then I was somehow found picked up in the street actually mm -hmm. almost by chance I met Jonathan in a gallery in London, he said, oh, we're trying to find somebody who understands German, who could do this exhibition, do a kind of manifestation about German culture, about which I knew in terms of contemporary culture very little. So I said, all right, I'll go to Germany yeah. for uh, a month, okay, mm -hmm. and I will, you know, do a nice German tour. So I did my, what I call my Winterheise, my sort of winter journey round Germany. I started off in Hamburg, then I went to Berlin, then I went to... Munich, then I went, I had a hundred pounds to do this. Mm. I was given a hundred pounds per day, you know, to do this little tour. And then I ended up in the Rhineland. Okay. And so in the end, I discovered there were two interesting poles for me yeah. that made sense. You know, one was the world around Joseph Boyce. Hmm? Yeah. And the other was the world around the painter, George Marcellitz, right. whom I discovered in the Michael Werner Gallery in Cologne. And I then I met this rather extraordinary Greek guy, Greek Greek guy who had, you know, international Greek guy who'd lived in Rome, had lived in Paris, but that now was based had studied with Heidegger in Heidelberg and so on and so forth. And he would organize this exhibition in Germany, which is called Art in the Political Struggle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Hanover, the Kunstverein. Uh, in the in the Kunstverein in in Hamburg. Uh, and I thought I would do a kind of version of that exhibition. Mm. I decided I wanted to do it, but there was no room to do both. I could either do Baselitz or I could do Art in the Project. So I chose, you know, it was 1974 was still, you know, the memory of 1968 was still very, which barely affected England. Would you agree with that? There was a little kind of tiny revolt at Hornsey School of Art, but not much. Not much happened in England. Would you agree with that? Largely. Hmm? Hmm. Though probably more than one thinks. Probably more than one thinks, but it was not very apparent. There were not grand demonstrations on the street. It no, was not like 
Kent State University. It was not like Paris, and it certainly wasn't like Germany. Certainly yeah. not like Paris, where there had been a tradition of lifting the cobblestone. Yeah, the world of, you know, da Danny Cohn-Bendit and the world of yeah. Rudy Dutschke and all of that. Mm -hmm. The world of, uh, you know, Benno Ornesorg, all of that world uh, and the Bader-Meinhof world. None of that really existed in England. I mean, England has always been a place of, for better and for worse, for worse and for better, of, in a way, suppression, yes. suppressing and very good at sort of subliminally suppressing problems. Sometimes it's good to suppress problems in terms of, you know. Well, it was thought to be good to suppress colonies as well. well I think, I think J Japan had a lot going on in 1968 as well. We don't know. Yeah, you, of course. Well, that, that's highly formalized, but yeah, I of course, to yeah. attempt you to talk mm -hmm. about that. Anyway, I did but this exhibition, which was very decisive for myself because I learned so much doing it. You know, making an exhibition anyway, whatever it is, whether you're doing Venetian art of the 16th century or contemporary exhibition. I remember Ernst Gombrich telling me when I got my job at the Royal Academy, Norman, I am so happy for you. You will learn so much. You know, so doing an exhibition is a form of learning, you know, because you have to... And I was able to do so many different things yeah. so that, you know, I'm a what they call, I don't know anything about anything, but I know a little bit about everything. You know? <laughs> I, I'm not a specialist, but I know a little bit about everything. So I did However. this exhibition, which ended up being called Art into Society. And we had this big symposium in Berlin where all, nearly all the artists came except for Hans Harker, who lived in uh, America at the time, so he couldn't come. But we had this beautiful symposium. And I, at that time, Joseph Boyce came to Berlin and we had this in the studio of an artist called Dieter Hacker. And one of the artists who was going to be in that exhibition was Wolf Fostel, mm -hmm. uh, who was a kind of, quite an, imp uh, an important, I think a rather terrible artist in fact, but uh, an important kind of uh, fluxus artist in his time. Mm. You know, an important, and he, because he was kind of jealous of Joseph Boyce, he decided to pull out. So we, you know, the seven artists were left with six. Mm. We were left with six. Six is not a very beautiful number. Seven is a beautiful number. You know, I mean, you know, there's a mysticism about right. the idea of seven. So what are we to do? And that's when Joseph Boyce said, "Why don't we invite Gustav to be in the exhibition?" Mm -hmm. And he told me about Gustav and who he was. And I'm not sure whether he was present at the Destruction and Art Symposium. I don't think he was, but Joseph, he certainly knew all no. about him. He was not present. Yeah, no, what? he refused to be, right? If I remember well. He refused to be there. But he certainly knew about Gustav yeah. and was very sympathetic to mm -hmm. his position at the time. And so that's how I met Gustav. Obviously, I came back from Berlin to Berlin, you know, and I went to meet him. And that's how I met him. Yeah, and, you know, we found, you know, we had, obviously, you know, for all sorts of obvious reasons, there was a kind of sympathy between us, you know what I mean? And he said he would do this exhibition. He would not participate in the exhibition. He would allow his name to go on the wall. <laughs> he would come to events, which he right. did. You know, Gustav was a great goer to events, yeah. all cultural. I mean, he would, you know, if there was a lecture on some obscure subject, He'd be you know, there. He'd be there in London, you know, yeah. cultural event. But what's interesting, though, is that for Joseph Boyce had decided right from the onset that he would be there throughout the show, except for one opening he had in Scotland, right? Yeah. And I really like that parallel that Gustav's told you the same thing. Yeah. I will not have artworks in the show, but I will be coming very regularly yeah. there. And Boyce also didn't want any artworks in the show, really. Mm. He just said, oh, I will come and I'll be part of kind of permanent discussion. Yeah. You know, a kind of cliche but useful concept that he wanted to be in discussion with people. Actually, yeah. we're getting a bit of an audience now. I'm getting quite optimistic. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. And there was, you know, so there was just, so Joseph Boy said, all I want is three blackboards, mm -hmm. you know, three blackboards. Where do I find blackboards? Yeah. So rather amazingly, I found, I didn't know where to find them. So I pushed around. I suddenly found this huge depot of, old school blackboards right. you know and i went to this depot somewhere in the in the london you know school depot yeah and i found hundreds of blackboards mm -hmm. so instead of giving joseph boys three blackboards 
I gave him a hundred blackboards out of which he made that famous environment, you know, called Richtkräfte, you know, directive forces, which you can see even now in the museum in Berlin. It was later bought by the Museum of Berlin. But there he was, talk, basically he was there to talk to people. Yeah. And Gustav was a great talker to people. So he would come to the exhibition and talk. Can you tell us a little bit more about the piece by Joseph? Because also what's quite interesting is that he told you right away that he wanted to do a school, but you have this idea of a school. Yeah. Which also was extremely scary. Well, something that scared mm -hmm. all the other members of the, mm -hmm. all the six other German artists because of what had just happened in the school that he yeah. set up. So, but sometimes there were a hundred people in the class and mm -hmm. sometimes there was just one person in the class. Yeah. And sometimes there was nobody there, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, Joseph would still continue to write and restore his yeah. things, and then he would pick them up and <laughs> throw them on the But then suddenly Gustav would appear, and they would engage in a dialogue and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And Gustav was, you know, who he was. And he was yeah. very small, by the way. People should remember that he was a very small person, yeah. very small, but incredibly piercing eyes, mm -hmm. you know. He was also... Amazing. He had these incredible, wonderful girlfriends, too, who, right to the end of his life, I remember just before, about two years before he died, he managed to pick up the most, dare I say it, one very un -PC thing to say, he picked up the most beautiful girl. He met a, most, a beautiful girl, helped him off the bus in East London, and they became best best friends and so they saw each other all, almost every day and she visited him in hospital as he was dying mm -hmm. and so on and so forth so just you know he had a complicated he had a charisma. beautiful life go back to a the beautiful show. life let's go back to the show one of the things that i really thoroughly love is one of the expression that joseph boyster said he was talking about having an active exhibition an exhibition which was not as which was different to the idea of a retrospective but something very which was very much alive yeah and it was one of the things that really struck me when you read the catalog is how it's a guide it's a guidebook to young curators really and the opening paragraph that in your introduction is really telling you the story of a group exhibition and how to make one and with all the caveats and all the um, problems that can occur during the making of one and i think this is in, as yeah, well, you I mean, every exhibition even that's what i want to the current exhibition i'm organizing in venice at the moment happens through dialogue with on my part, mm -hmm. dialogue with artists. You know, it's it's artists who tell you about other artists. It is, you know, it's it's how to reach into the subculture yeah. of art. It's a kind of, you know, mock contemporary art is always a kind of subculture. And that time it was a really very very narrow subculture. Sure. Not like today, you know, what we now live in this world of art fairs and uh, mega exhibitions and huge biennales everywhere mm. and so on and so forth. And, you know, Gustav occasionally was not, not surprising. He was able, you know, one of the last things he did was to do one of his his great car environment. Yeah, in, so my, in the of all places. I don't think he went there. In fact, I know he didn't. But somehow he allowed this to happen in Charger of yeah. all places. You know, the most unlikely thing. You know, you would think the kind of thing that in some oil wealthy mm. shake them somewhere in the Middle East. He allowed this, uh, you know, there were lots of little contradictions of Gustav too. Yeah, but like, on the other hand, is that I want to, place you know, to maybe it? read, you know, I mean, you've got the beautiful book where it's probably all in there, but, you know, if I can just read a little bit, you know, this beautiful book, which is called Damage Nature, Autodestructive Art, you know. So, Gustav speaking. First, we had nature. Then came the environment. Environment is a smoke humanity has put on nature. The people who used, the, who used Latin, i.e. I, people long, long ago, had no word for environment. They only knew, nat they only knew natura. There is an, uh, there is an urgent... That's a beautiful word that our dear friend uh, Obris is always using. Indeed, that's right. Urgent need to redefine notions of nature and environment. The term environment has been hijacked by the forces that are manipulating the world. The term environment lends itself perfectly to telling lies and giving illusions. 
the people who run production and distribution, the controllers of the media and government, local and national, are systematically, systematically using the term environment to hide realities, confuse the public. You know, this is long before uh, uh, the concepts of, uh, of uh, you know, truth, what's it called? Um, you know, you know, false, false, false truth. Oh, you know? Fake news. Fake news. Long before the idea, you know, confuse the public, fake news, and distort their perception of reality. Mm. And then later, where he says, Gustav, the move against nature is a move against one's own nature. This is in line with Christianity. A walk in the woods, and listen to this, I think it's too beautiful. The supermarket as a surrogate for picking berries in the woods, low down but accessible. The new market, nature surrogates. The bath as a substitute for the glades, jacuzzi. These developments serve as a replacement for nature make nature redundant. Mm. And then, talking about, you know, the problem of trees. If I were to return to the forests I knew as a child, in the environs of Nuremberg, the forests I missed so much when I went to England as a refugee, I would react in a completely different way to my early experience. Instead of the profound calm I knew then, there would be feelings of unease and of anxiety, fear even. Mm. And in place of the deep colors that I observed, I would be faced with so many sights indicating that some radical change for the worse has occurred. What are these changes from nature to the environment? I think he's thinking of trees which are yeah. you know which are d diseased trees i mean i read the other day somewhere that you know 50 or is it 70 percent of the world's trees are under threat from disease and that even i mean recently you know there was joseph boyce who did his famous action seven thousand trees and recently at some symposium in london i suggested we do uh, that we launch with Hans Oberst a kind of art project, seven billion trees, but it's not as easy as that, because actually even the planting of trees brings with it inherent danger. Mm. You know, again, I can read another little chapter, you know, there are so many microbes now being released into the world that actually even the planting of trees can encourage the destruction of the forests. That's the kind of the tragedy that perhaps we are in. You know, I'm 75 years old. I will be 75 years old next month. Mm. So my life has, I, I've lived through, you know, the most amazing uh, life. And if I can go back to this other book for a minute, you know, where this guy says, if I can find it, you know, where he writes about his mother who was also a refugee, I can find the little bit. It's rather beautiful, this moment, in this book. I think I put a little thing here. But basically, he says his mother, who was a refugee from Germany to America. Yeah, here it is. The single lifetime is also the lifetime of my mother, I, the lifetime of myself. Born in 1945, I was born in 1944, to German Jews fleeing the smokestacks through which their relatives were incinerated, like Gustav's. And now enjoying her 73rd year, I'm in my 74th year, in an American, UK is more or less the same, Swiss the same, commodity paradise. A paradise supported by the factories of a developing world that has, in the space of a single lifetime, two manufactured its way into the global middle class with all the consumer enticements 
and fossil fuel privileges that come with that ascent, with that ascent. Electricity, private cars, I can't drive, but be that as it may. Air travel, I take loads of air flights. Red meat, I love it. She's been smoking for 58 of these years. I don't smoke unfiltered, but you know, that's ordering the cigarettes now by the carton from China. It's kind of rather amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's a rather beautiful image that I belong to a generation, probably privileged in a way that no, no generation in the history of mankind has been so privileged. You know, we go to the toilets, we live, you know, flushing the toilets, which in the 19th century was impossible, you know, or in the 17th century would walk the streets of London and we, people would just throw their... Uh, you know, I do know this even from art history, even in my room, I have this rather wonderful uh, print of a famous 17th century Dutch artist where uh, a, uh, an artist, where uh, a woman is throwing excrement out onto the, onto the street. That's the subject of the print. Do you know what I mean? I have that in my kitchen. You know, that was the world that people lived in, even into the 19th century, where in uh, 1900, there were more pianos in the United States than there were toilets, you know, uh, flush toilets, you know, where people went into the garden to shit. So, you know, I live in, I've lived in this privilege. Now I have to say, what will my children live through? And what, if they have them, will their grandchildren live through? If one knows the kind of predictions, the Gustav was amazingly good, well, not good, well, make, but through the knowledge that he gleaned, you know, he, he, because of, he read, he talked to scientists, you know, he was very like, you know, he was very good at talking to people and finding them out and find, you know, getting, uh, getting knowledge, you know, which he then computed into his works. And it's very sad to me, even today, and of course this manifestation is a very helpful thing that, but, you know, Gustav needs to be far, far, far more famous. I think this book Which hopefully will true. help. And but, such you know, I was suggesting to you yesterday that somebody needs to write a biography because biography is important too. And I think it's necessary to write a very careful and very carefully. A young person needs to make it mm. his or her task, or her or his, one should say now, her or his task, to document the life of Gustav, which was a life that really tells the story of the 20th and very early 21st century and its trajectories, both good but above all bad, mm. uh, that we, who you know, I am, you know, and I'm, should I apologize for the good life I've led? I have no idea. What do you think? That's the question I'd like to perhaps open to discussion. What? We should be grateful for the good life we've had, of course. Yeah, but is that enough? I mean, there's nothing else we can do, is there? Because, of course, Gustav didn't, you know, it's like all prophets. I mean, if you read the Bible, which I like to do sometimes, you know, not because I'm a religious person, because it's an amazing work of literature. Apart from, you know, God will... God will bring, you know, bring your house down, as it were, and God will bring, you know, rain will, you know, locusts will fall on, you know, the seven plagues and so on and so forth. What are the solutions that man can come up with? And there don't seem to be, at this moment in time, that many solutions to bringing back the sparrows, bringing back the thrushes, bringing back the blackbirds, bringing back, you know, all these... Mm. Yeah, all the things that are now in danger, even, you know, I've now, for better or worse, you know, I'm a very privileged person. You know, I've managed for the next three years to find myself a kind of country place because I love going to the country. I love looking at trees. You know, it's nothing more beautiful than a tree in winter. You know, looking at the drawing that is a tree. David Hockney has been very good at that too. You know, he's somehow discovered the country, you know, this incredibly urban person, but in later life discovering what, how beautiful a bare tree can be and just just sitting and looking at it or going for a walk a winter walk is nothing more fantastic i've discovered this incredibly late in life so for the next three years i have a little country house but even in that time and it's a house i've been going to five for five years and even in that time i'm noticing 
the paucity of the relative paucity of animal life. Actually, foxes now, you see more easily in the streets of London. I have seen a fox walking down Regent Street and, walking in, and a fox walking in the Strand, and now I barely see a fox in the countryside. Can you explain that too, you know? Because, of course, they're after the, you know, those black bags that, you know, which they can ravage, you know, late at night because that's where they get their food from. And I gather, and I live right in the very centre of London. I live two minutes or three minutes away from Piccadilly Circus, you know. Uh, that's where, is where my home is in Soho. But I've crossed Regent Street in London, which most of you in this room will probably have been in, you know, maybe coming back after some beautiful private view or free art dinner, you know, at 11 o'clock at night. And, or 12 o'clock at night, and I've seen foxes walking in the street and not batting an eyelid, but in the streets of London. Yeah. Let's go back to that. Anyway, let's have a bit of discussion, shall we? Have I uh, told you enough for the moment or not? Do you want more? Wonderful. I mean, just great stories. That's what, you, that's what you're here for, Jim. To, for that to be shared. There's two things I wanted, really wanted to ask you, that right away, Christopher decided not to contribute any works of art for the exhibition. But I'd like to know what kind of involvement you and Christos had with him about the contribution he would do to the catalog and how these three. Well, he basically, you know, he did this. He wrote, he's, I mean, he told us that's what he was going to do. Mm -hmm. And then he presented us with, you know, at that time, I did something which I like to do with a catalog. I like to give, you know, if I do a group show, and this was the first group show I ever did, you know, I like to give each artist a fixed number of pages. So I think there's seven pages or eight pages, seven pages each artist, and have a photograph of the artist because I think, you know, there's nothing. I remember even it's one of the things I learned when I was at university. Right. I remember arriving at university as a kind of freshman, mm -hmm. going to my very first lecture on Anglo-Saxon uh, documents, you know? And there was this very famous woman from Oxford who was coming to my little university to give a lecture. And I said, that, so I remember the lecturer telling me this wonderful story. Go to the lecture, even though you won't understand a word this woman says, you know, because by seeing her, it will help you later to read her books. And I think knowing what an artist looks like and actually being with them, mm. You know, because human beings have aura. Every human being has his own or her individual aura. Gustav had unbelievable aura. Mm. So just to see Gustav, to be in a room with him, to see him come into, you know, if he were to walk into this room and sit down over there, and you would feel his presence. And that presence was very beautiful mm. and very fantastic. So this idea, you know, go to the lecture, you, go to this lecture, you won't understand a word, but look at this woman. She was called Professor Margaret Deansley. I even can remember her name. Mm. And she was a great expert on Anglo-Saxon on Anglo -Saxon documents. Mm. You know, and she'd written some incredibly important book a long time ago. And she was about 70 years old. I was 20. Mm. You know, so uh, go and look at her. Just see her. Then you can read her books more easily. I think that's true. Don't you agree? Mm. These Let are kind of little wisdoms that I picked up. So getting to know Gustav helped you to understand and understand who he is. And even if you didn't actually meet him, even to see him is very, very important. What I'd like to discuss with you is one of the lines that Joachim wrote, that Christos wrote in, his, in the catalog, which was recently Metzger has concerned himself with the formulation of a comprehensive and uncompromising criticism of the mechanism of art marketing which, of course, he went on to develop the Three Years Without yeah, Art, he, which he, he published in Yeah, he wrote this thing. He wrote, produced this rather kind of chaotic bibliography. I don't know how accurate it is, but it, it is a wonderful idea. We recreated it for a show. I, did I mean, he yeah. made this himself. Yeah. I mean, he did this. I mean, it's a kind of astonishing thing. I mean, you know, he was not in that sense a scholar, no. but he was a scholar. And he was able to go and, you know, had the persistence mm -hmm. to produce this, uh, you know, this long kind of bibliography, you know, just about the art market, the art dealer, he's called, you know, yep. including the very first thing is a book that I produced because my very first job is Agnew's 1817 to 
the Agnews, 1967. I put that big, mm -hmm. I put that book together really? as a boy, you know. So it's kind of rather, I like these little poems. You know, it's like a little private poem. You know, everybody needs, I think every individual needs to find right. their own poetry in life. Also, the poetry of chance. You know, I had the great privilege of meeting John Cage. You probably knew him too. But I had, you know, I got very friendly with him yeah. later in his life and uh, even went mushroom picking with him. Mm. But I mean, you know, to meet, to understand with the presence of something like that, the power of chance. Right. So even now, I'm actually, I've not looked at this, I'd even forgotten. I've just realized mm. that the very first thing, so as I look at it now, I did never, I haven't looked at it for so many years. This sits on my bookshelf at home. <laughs> and as I look at it now, I suddenly see that the very first thing called books, yeah. then it has periodical li literature, one art, of my magazines, favorite art and artists, art in America. Number 14 is one of my favorite But the ones. very first thing is a book that I actually is. authored. Isn't that funny? I'd authored 10 years earlier. And then it would come back as a criticism of the art dealer there. Yeah, but it's, you know, I worked at an art dealer, so mm. that was my first job. And I think that's sort of something I'm realizing now. I didn't realize that till this minute. <laughs> I'd forgotten. If I knew, I hadn't noticed in that way as I'm noticing now. So these little poems in life are very important. And chance is very important. And meeting is important. And I mean, it's incredible meeting that when I knew Gusta, I remember meeting him somewhere on Waterloo Bridge. And at that time, I, you know, I hadn't seen him for several, for quite a long time. And I think at that moment, for all sorts of reasons, mm -hmm. I needed to meet him. And suddenly he popped up, okay. you know, so, so this ability to pop up at the moment, he had that ability, didn't he? to pop up. He was uh, he was that's ubiquitous, exactly. and I feel he's even in this room now. Oh, that's for sure. <laughs> what do you think was the impact of such of this endeavor? Do you think that was something that was understood at the time? Oh, yeah, I think it did have that exhibition. I mean, you'll probably know more. You know, it's very difficult to talk about the impact of one's own work, but uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot of artists in London were affected by it. Yeah. You know, first of all, it brought Boyce to London as in a substance. He had been to the Tate Gallery a bit earlier, but yeah, two years it really before. was the biggest manifestation he'd ever done in London. Of course, he'd done a lot, thanks to Ricky DeMarco in Scotland, mm -hmm. but he hadn't done very much in London. So it was his first big sculptural event that he made, an environment that he made in London. Yeah. And... Uh, um, which then traveled to Venice. They were shown at the Venice Biennale. It was shown at René Bloch's gallery in New York mm -hmm. and then ended up in Berlin. And uh, it's, you know, it was a very spectacular piece of sculpture. I feel a little bit kind of implicit in it, of course. Hmm? Yes, of yeah, course. If I'm allowed to. Mm. And how did you feel personally with Gustav's attack to the, against the art market? Was it something that you encouraged him as well? I mean, you know, first of all, I have great, res not only, of course, if you recognize somebody as a, a significant artist, you're very respectful of what they do because that's, you know, it's the, that's what you do. I yeah. mean, that's what I do. I'm not an artist and don't pretend to be, my job is as a kind of mediator or try to be a mediator and get it out there. You know what right. I mean? Get it out there and to get other people to participate. You know, there's nothing more, you know, young people, but also old people, you know, to kind of, Right. Come to see the exhibition that you put together, and that's what I do, you know. Mm. So, in some ways, you, I mean, we're at one level, we're all artists, as Boyce like to say, whatever that means. Yes. Um, I'm not saying that I'm an artist, but I've had this incredible privilege of being, when I, when I found it can, you know, when it's been, uh, when I've been able to offer something, mm -hmm. you know, I never chased Gustav. I never chased Joseph Boyce. Yeah. I never chased any artist, but if I'm able to give them a platform yeah. through circumstance, through happenstance, mm -hmm. then it's, you know, a wonderful thing to be able to do. And I've done this all my life, you yeah. know, which is, I mean, what's quite fascinating with your relationship with Gustav is that, um, that would be the only show you work on together would have a long lasting impact as we know, it would be one of the very great moments, but you would keep being friendly towards this until oh, the very yeah. end. However, this is the only incarnation. And he didn't you... always approve of what I was doing, of course. Yeah. Oh no, there was there were moments of great disapproval, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, first of all, you know, when I did things like a new spirit in painting, you know, which of course was, 
made a huge change. That, you know, that exhibition really did change yeah. the art market in a kind of, from Gustav's perspective, a negative way. Mm. I think it was a moment of, that allowed for a huge explosion. Well, you once told me that that was something that you knew was going to happen. When you put on that show, you knew that the art market would change with that. Well, the I whole don't know. I don't think I knew. I think it happened yeah. at that moment. You know, it was the first moment that, you know, that late, late Picasso was sort of reassessed. That was really exhibited as valuable and useful work, because until then, people generally thought mm. that if Picasso had died in about 1951 or 1952 after he did you know, it would have been better for his mm. reputation. Mm. <laughs> and suddenly people started appreciating the late work of Picasso. Anyway, Gustav did not approve of the art market, as we know. And he didn't approve of, and he thought, well, in some ways, what I was doing was compromising. And then maybe he was right, you know, I mean. Uh, How do you reflect But I mean, as I now? say, I eat red meat. He didn't eat red meat. Um, I live, I get on jet planes, which uh, yeah, occasionally he did, but very rarely. But you know, my life as a, a bloody international, a bloody international curator <laughs> is one of that involves flying, but mm. then, you know, musicians are even worse, you know, right. if you're a conductor or a singer, an opera singer or whatever, you know, you're, you're never. Because then your presence required. Mother. Yeah. I mean, that's what it's like. So. We're all, but we all the, live compromised lives. One of the things that approved though is, as you told us, when you did the Frank Harbach show, yeah. he would be there then. Yeah, for the, but, you know. But that's yeah, but they are both very, both Frank, who lives in this very, lives in a studio, not much bigger than this, you know, the area in which we're sitting, and he still lives like that. Right. Try, once, you know, lives, lives very, very modestly, mm. never travels. And there's also a very pure soul, mm. you know, in himself. Right. Of course, he puts his paintings into the into the marketplace, but you know, that's what he does. You mm. know, he likes painting and believes in the art of painting. And curious enough, Gustav was interested in painting. Mm. He was interested in art for a long time. He was obsessed by Vermeer, and he kept talking to me about Vermeer. I never saw. I never quite understood. Maybe some of you guys here will tell me exactly what he was trying to do with Vermeer, but he went to Holland somehow. Yeah, yeah that's right. He went into archives and he tried to find out something to do with, he was obsessed by, I think, Vermeerian perspectives, I think, something like that, isn't that right? Well, we don't and know. And compositional, yeah. compositional ideas around Vermeer, but I've never, I never fully understood, you know, it's like the, can I say, it's like the questions I, you know, Gustav, I've had a fair, even though he was, yeah, he was older than me, of course. I mean, he was to me like, I, he was a kind of father figure to me, mm. in a way. And, you know, the thing about particularly of people who went through those experiences, who didn't like to talk very much about the past and, you know, the ghastly pasts that they had lived through. Well, that's what it's the... like my parents, you know, I suppose for me now in my life, the questions I never asked my parents. Mm questions that I never asked Gustav are a source of regret to me. One of the things when we were preparing our talk today, you, you, you used the word for you, Gustav, with the prophet of extinction. Of course, the extinction that we've just discussed about the looming threat with cl climate change and global extinction, but also the extinction of the Holocaust. And that of parallel course, was yeah. of great interest. And I'd like, can you say yeah. a few words about that? Well, I mean, you know, like, he didn't like my parents. My parents, you know, my... You know, I got my German citizenship mm -hmm. last two weeks ago when I went to the German embassy and met the German ambassador. And I have this little souvenir from my aunt, who I've talked about earlier, which is the Iron Cross that my, you know, distinguished Iron Cross that my uncle, whom I never knew, Uncle Walter, uh, you know, who won in the First World War, you know. There are th million, thousands and thousands of stories. This just happens to be my personal story. Mm. But I own this Iron Cross, which I have on my table at home, you know, on a table at home, along with other kind of souvenirs of culture. And I have this Iron Cross, which I can see every day. So I put it in my pocket as I went to the German embassy. I shared it to the German embassy. I said, my, and he looked at it and he says, yes, you can see 
he looked at this he looked this German ambassador it's a kind of friend he looked at this uh, he looked at the Iron Cross and you could see the you know the the Hohenzollern Wilhelm you know Wilhelmine kind of uh, coat of arms on it and so on and so forth you know it's from that time so he won the Iron Cross which millions of, no he was not the only one by any means he was I don't know whether everybody got one. I don't think so. But anyway, he got one. And then, of course, he was rounded up and died in Auschwitz. And my, you know, my grandmother died in Auschwitz. You know, so what does one say about all these things? And one's parents did not like to talk about it. And I, on the whole, preferred not to ask Gustav about his... In fact, I didn't ask Gustav about those times. I wish I had, just as I wish I'd asked my parents about those times they didn't like to talk about it they lived in a kind of subliminal present trying not to you know i dare say they were they were traumatized mm. in their different ways and i know that gustav was traumatized by the loss of many of his relatives he had i think a brother I'm not sure it was the brother who, who then died, who was a rabbi who was who lived in Strasbourg, who then died recently on a bicycle, who yeah. died just before he did. In my talk, I talk about all of the people who died in yeah. his life. His parents both died, his older brother died, his two sisters escaped through yeah. Sweden, people and his like brother that. came on the kinder transport. Yeah. So, you know, um, Frank certainly does. Frank Arbach, I know, does not like to talk about his parents. Yeah. You know, he prefers not to think about them. He's actually expressed the fact. He, you know, he thinks. But I know a lot of people, including my father and Gustav, were traumatized mm. by the knowledge that their mother died in these unspeakable conditions. You know, and they, you know. But then, you know, how many people died? You know, those poor young, you only have to read uh, Anthony Beaver's book on Stalingrad, you know, how, you know, 17 year old German Aryan youths died in the most horrific circumstances in the muddy fields outside Stalingrad. I mean, in a way that was almost worse, you know, in t if, they, if one can, if there's a way of measuring, if there's a way of measuring, mm you know, horrible death, you know? So I feel I want to, can we switch on more lights so I can see you all or not? Can we do, can we alter the lights? Can you come forward if we're going to have a discussion? I mean, you know, as I say, we live, we all live in a kind of world, win worlds between incredible pleasure mm. in the knowledge that ghastly things, you know, I'm going to go to, hear Helmut Lachemann's or see and hear Helmut Lachemann's new, not new, but a new performance of his ballet based on, uh, on uh, you know, I can't remember on, what is German Streichhölzer, do you know? Uh, uh, there's a ballet by Helmut Lachemann that's being performed in Zurich. As I happen to be in Zurich, I want to go there at seven o'clock this evening and I got myself a ticket. So I have this kind of, and I live between pleasure. We all live between pleasure and existential nightmares that we can contemplate and you know sometimes it's better if we contemplated them all the time would we be able to live you know you know my daughter has just got a job my youngest daughter has just got a job in london with with the police but she's incredibly politically engaged and she's been telling me i don't think i can go ahead with this job you know because you know she doesn't want to work with the police in London, even though she's studying law, do you understand? Mm. So, you know, we all have, we all live between, ex, you know, what, we're, what we are happy to do, what we're guilty of doing, and what we know we mustn't do. You know, we mustn't murder on the whole. You know, we know that, we mustn't steal, even though a young artist, friend of mine, I, whom I've just, I'm actually going to include in this exhibition in, in Venice. I, I met him recently. I said, how do you live? Because how do you eat? Because, you know, he doesn't have any money, blah, 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 blah. He says, I have to shoplift. What? Well, I'm not going to tell you who shoplifts. 
<laughs> no, but you can tell us which artist you're going to include in the show then. No, I'm not. Not here. You'll find out. But what I'm just telling you that, you know, you know how, to, how do you live? I mean, all these kind of kids in Zurich who are drug addicts, you can see. I mean, how does this area? I mean, I usually when I come to Zurich, I stay in rather, so you know, with great friends of mine who live in a very beautiful apartment just next to the Kunsthaus next to the Kunsthaus, you know, my friend Christian and Katharina Schmidt, who is my, Christian is my very oldest friend, and like a brother of mine, and they live in great sort of comfort and luxury in a very beautiful part in the Altstadt of, of, of Zurich. And I come out here and I, and I come out here and I look at the hideousness of this part of Zurich. You know, I mean, how was it allowed that this part of Zurich was even built? You know, this bad brutalism and worse, you know, this, we're living, you know, when I come out here on the number four, I thought I was coming, I thought I suddenly, I was in Zurich at one end of the bus line, you know, the Zurich that I know and love. When I come out here, I think I'm in, you know, some sub, ghastly suburb in somewhere in middle America. But you're also in a great school. What? Also a great school. So, yeah. Do How you... does that get built in beautiful, Let's go back to the subject. Okay. No, I think Gustav would be interested in that. I would think so too. I think Gustav would be interested in this part of the world. He would un he would see the horror and the kind of horror that has created this area. Which is, you know, you know, I could see them even last night, full of drug addicts and so on and so forth on the streets. Gustav. You laugh. No, I'm smiling, that's different. So who would like to join us? But I mean, it would be helpful if we turned off the spotlights. Is anybody able to do that? And made a bit more kind of ambient light in the room? Yes. Svetlana? No, that's better. That's better for me. Um, well, I'm obviously slightly a little bit younger, but I still had a chance being the generation meeting. By the way, I should have put my hearing aids on. And I meeting a little Gustav. bit bad, a little hard of hearing now. So you've got to come and okay. either speak up. Okay, so and even better without the microphone because I hear better if you sh shout. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, um, I'm obviously a little bit slightly younger than than uh, you, Norman, for example. Uh, but I still had an encounter with Gustav several times, and I just wonder, since it had been mentioned so many times, and also through reading his texts, he was a visionary about certain issues and maybe as you said he was a very good researcher putting things together from the information he collected but i wonder if the um, the artwork kind of failed or ignored him because there have been many shows uh, dealing with environmental issues with destruction through technology or development of technology uh, big group shows where i did not see gustav's i work know what included. you mean but for example, he had a very beautiful exhibition that was put together at the, what's it called, that found, Generali Foundation yeah. in, in Vienna. Unfortunately, the Tate Gallery did put, a, put together, a, you know, he's an incredibly important gallery, but I don't know whether the Tate will ever, or a major British museum, because in the end, you know, his, to use a, you know, his Ausstrahlung, how would you pronounce that word into English? Oh. His, uh, his imminence, you know, is an imminence that came out of Great Britain. You know, that's oh. where, even though he spent time in Germany, he went a little bit to Holland, you know, but ultimately he's a, a kind of British artist in the sense of Frank Auerbach, is it not? Okay. But, you know, on the whole, he's not really been properly embraced by the British art cultural establishment at the highest level. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree, yeah. yeah. He's had a show at the. Hang on, Andrew. But I don't even mean like big retrospectives. Do you mind I've if seen I move the show at the now? Generali? Yeah. But like, it seems like also younger curators would be very much interested in Gustav's works because it's very actual and very recent. But um, that's that was kind of the question. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Um, that I didn't even mean the big retrospectives like the Generali exhibition or... Um, and, um, well, that's why I think of biography, country. because he had a very ev strangely eventful life in many respects, both in terms of who he was and the history in which he lived. And I think a really great... Somebody, if somebody that's in this room, you or you or you, were to devote 
a few years of your life, maybe with some grant, some that would be given by some of you, do a peer. Somebody should write a biography. It's a great subject for, you know, so many stupid PhDs are done. If somebody <coughs> would write a biography, you know, right. it's one thing, this is a wonderful book, but that in itself, we need to tell the story of Gustav. And Gustav is a story which I know partially. I don't know the whole story by any means. You know, I know it partially, but I know, and this book of, uh, of writings tells you a huge amount. His time in King's Lynn, where he was interested in, you know, the churches of East Anglia. You know, he was very interested in the history of culture. He really was, and he would, you know, apply himself. He was a very cultured person, you know, and he wanted to, he wanted, he was interested in Caravaggio. He was interested in Vermeer. He was interested in the history of culture. He was, and uh, so to follow him, but actually this biography would be a really, and the sooner it's done, the better. That is, I would say, to use uh, over his favorite word, uh, I would say it's urgent, a biography of Gustav. And I think if some young person were to spend four, three, four, five years making, writing a biography, I think the world would be very grateful because I no, think he is there. He's an artist, you know, well, I gather there was a discussion yesterday about Joseph Boyce, which was a little bit negative about him. But, you know, we're all prisoners of our world. You know, I mean, I've often said, I always fantasize when I, if I look at Lenny Riefenstahl's films of Nuremberg, uh, Nuremberg, I said this yesterday at the dinner. Some of you may have heard me say this yesterday. But I, you know, and I knew Joseph Boyce incredibly well. I knew him far better in, a way, in many ways than I knew Gustav. Uh, and I was very close to him. Uh, but, I mean, I often imagine that if you look carefully, were to look frame by frame by frame at Lenny Riefenstahl's Nuremberg Rally uh, films, somewhere in there might well be a tiny little speck that if you blew it up digitally in some way, you would see the face of Joseph Boyce. And after all, you know, he was a prisoner of his epoch. We're all prisoners of our epochs. I'm a prisoner of you know, the meat-eating, flying generation. Do you know what I mean? So I'm a sinner too. We're all sinners. Uh, Gustav was not a sinner because he really consciously did not want to be one. So he went out of his way not to be a sinner, whereas most of us are, you know, happy sinners. Svetlana, there was one thing I think which would be relevant if you could tell us the story of when you met Gustav in, um, in Munich, because we spoke a lot about Germany, right? And me, you were- the time? Can you tell me the time? Um, Can we tell me the time? The time. What yeah. time is it? The time is half past four. Okay, fine. Um, yeah, but I don't know if it's relevant, right? I think it's very relevant to the relationship with Germany that we talked about, because you told me how, I'm yeah. scared is not the right word, but yeah. frail um, well, uh, and, and secure. I am an artist as well, and I was participating in the exhibition Dream City in 1998 in Munich. Um, and it was like uh, three big institutions, Haus der Kunst, Villa Stuck, and the Kunstverein, uh, dedicate, de dedicated an exhibition to historical positions, but also contemporary art positions and commissioned works for this exhibition. And one of the commissioned work was by Gustav Metzger. And um, uh, I misunderstood but I thought it was his first time after he came mm. back to Germany but obviously he was in Germany before but maybe it was his first time being in Munich yeah. or in Bavaria because I know it was very emotional and very yes. um, um, yeah I, I, I know that the curators were not even sure if he would arrive mm. he was and, always using his passport by the way he had a kind of stateless passport yes and he would always mislay it and then his friends you would have to kind of reorganize unbelieve in the last minute unbelievably complicated exactly. thing to have to do the reorganize organizing gustav's passport so that he could travel and he would always kind of make you do it make people do it for him he was very good at manipulating people by the way gustav wasn't he yeah. he was a real manipulator of persons yeah. You know, he, he wanted something done, he would get his way. 
Yes, and I, I also, uh, when he arrived, he was very, he was shaking and he was physically also very affected of the fact yeah. being in Munich and in front of the house. No, but he went to Nuremberg too, which was his yeah. home city, yeah. which after all itself has, I mean, Munich has resonance in terms of uh, national socialist history, but so of course does Nuremberg, mm -hmm. more than. Of mm -hmm. course, yeah. City of Hans Sachs. Nuremberg mm trials. -hmm. Yes, the great German poet and subject, of course, of that famous opera. I have a question for you. You said at one point in your discourse, we all uh, are comprom live compromised lives. I'd like to know how you think Gustav was compromised. How was Gustav? Compromise. I don't think, I mean, you know, it's, I think we can only look at ourselves for a start. Was Gustav compromised? Only insofar as that he was, I'm not sure that he, you know, when I read what he writes, and I'm very thrilled to see this book that Matthew, Matthew has done, that though he analyzes the situation in terms of, capitalism and it's you know capitalism the capitalist society that we live in and uh, other systems or other ways of living you know whether he has any solutions so i think it's about the solutions you know we live in a capitalist you know you know who you know we you know lenin says what to do then when you actually analyze what actually happened, you know, with Lenin and the consequences of Lenin, was it a good thing or it was, was it a good thing or a bad thing? But curious enough, as I left Venice yesterday, there was this huge demo in front of, I mean, when I say huge, there were a hundred people in front of the railway station at Venice, uh, you know, Venice, I, as I passed on my way to Piazzale Roma, uh, some of you know, we know where to leave Venice. I passed the, on the Vaporetto, I passed this uh, big station, you know, that beautiful kind of fascist building that is in Venice. And there were all these people holding up a uh, big fl a, a Soviet, I mean, uh, a sickle, and also big, uh, I don't know why they were doing, big banners with the face of Stalin on them like a little demo with the faces of Stalin on them. So, you know, there are still people who dream of that world. And there are in Russia too. And we're living in, you know, but I mean, you know, we know that the consequences of Lenin and, you know, that miraculous moment in art, that amazing time for 10 years, or maybe for 20 years for, you know, like, in about the four years before, four to five years before 1917 and 10 years after, when Russia was the most advanced visual culture in the world by a long, long, long way. You know, you know they really did it. They, you know, they made the running, not only in terms of abstraction, but in terms of everything. I organized an exhibition, curious enough, in Turkey on the subject relatively recently and actually again you know organizing as an exhibition like that makes you realize what extraordinary things went on, on in russia at that time in cultural circles you know what i mean both in terms of obviously the visual arts you know when there were more women artists suddenly than you know i mean you know suddenly there were as many almost as many interesting men women as there were men and you know the incredible kind of both both in terms of pure art, so-called pure art, and applied arts, and music, and literature. I mean, they were astonishingly, the avant-gardism could not have gone further. And Gustav is always saying Either. here that, you know, the problem with Zurich Dada is that he was fantastic, but it didn't go far enough in terms of auto-destruction. So, you know, so there, you know, so there's that kind of incredible dream moment of the Russian avant-garde, and obviously a lot of people believed, and you understand how people believe, but then came what, you know, what, what was to follow. So what do we say? You know, it is the problem is, you know, in th the problem, in my opinion, but who am I to say? You know, mankind has become like, 
it has a Malthusian problem, and Gustav talks about Malthus, Malthus, you know, the you know the population guy at the beginning of the 19th century, not Malthus, but Malthus, you know. And uh, uh, by the way, I knew Malthus too, by the way, but I never knew Mal Malthus. Of course, I'm too young. Uh, Malthus, you know, about the the popul you know, we have become the rabbits of the world. We've become like a pest. Mankind has become a pest. That's the problem. By reproduction and by you know the, sh the sheer number of people that now exist on the planet there ain't I, that's where there it's in that department there is no solution in my opinion and so I, i'm just one of them i'm just a nasty kind of pest on the planet okay go ahead do you think that um following on from that the nasty pests on the planet do you, do you think that's the last one of the last taboos i have this theory that that um Overpopulation is one of the last taboos in our society to discuss. Well, that's sort of taboo. It's, I don't think, I mean, people are not taught, curiously enough, that we used to be talked about far more 30, 40 years ago than it is now. I don't know why. Do, would you agree with that? People used to talk much more about overpopulation when I was young than they seem to do now, when life is thought to be, you know, so sacred. And probably mass extinction, certainly of human beings, may just be a, a way that the natural world will control itself. Maybe that is the only solution. There are various diseases and so on that come and destroy until yeah. we find a way of curing them. But you were talking about Stalin. When I was uh, very young, Stalin was my greatest hero. And uh, when in uh, the industrial part of South Wales, they would have movies uh, and they would show a oh, picture yeah. of Churchill, people would boo. Because Churchill had sent uh, militia to shoot at, uh, demonstrating at, at industrial people who were oh, demonstrating no, I... for oh, yeah. higher wages and way of life. Uh, and he probably killed proportionately as many as Stalin did, but in in relation to the well, that's you know we all sang Mao 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 Tse Tung, yeah, and not only that, you know, I mean when I remember, you know, I I have not been to Israel very often because I find it a rather uncomfortable place, but that's another long story myself. But I did once go and I sought out some relatives of mine on some very long 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 time ago. So I sought out these relatives on a distant relatives on a very pure kibbutz. You know, in the days when kibbutz, in the kibbutz was thought to be a kind of paradise on earth, blah, 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 and so on. And I talked to these people, and I remember them saying, telling me this amazing story, that there's a very happy festival. The one happy festival in the Jewish calendar is the story of Esther, and a story called, a festival called Purim. Okay, when, uh, you know, the, the story of Esther, which some of you may know from the Bible, you know, and she saved the Jews from uh, this terrible man who was trying to kill them. So this is a happy festival. A lot of dancing goes on. It just so happens Stalin died on the day of Purim. By the way, incidentally, Prokofiev died on the very same day as Stalin, some of you may know. But anyway, Stalin died on this, and they cancelled all the parties on the kibbutz. You know, they were in tears, in floods of tears. And of course, it was Stalin. He was the first person to recognize the, the first head of state to recognize the state of Israel. You know, so there's also that aspect of things. You know, history is full of paradox. History is full of, you know, and when we were young, we all believed in Mao. Do you know what I mean? Little red books and so on and so forth, you know. And, you know, but we now know, you know, we now know that Mao, it was Mao, you know, I mean, we don't need to speak of the kind of the terrible destructions that, that were wrought both above all to people and also to culture by the Cultural Revolution. Norman, we're going to have to end it now, though. We're going to have to end it now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will continue all together in, at five o'clock when we will be joined for that round table. So please do come back then. There's a round table. Yeah, there is. Okay. What time is that? Five.
at five o'clock. I can leave at six. You will, don't worry. I have to leave at six. You will. Thank you.